Pauline Viviano, PhD, is an associate professor emerita of theology at Loyola University of Chicago, where she taught for 35 years. She holds a doctorate in biblical languages and literature from St. Louis University. Besides articles in academic and popular journals, she has written popular commentaries on the books of Genesis, the Collegeville Bible Commentary Series, and more recently on the books of Jeremiah and Baruch for the new Collegeville Commentary Series. She's completed a commentary on the book of Joshua for Paulus Press, forthcoming uh, Paulus Press Biblical Commentary, and is presently working on a literary analysis of the books of Jeremiah and Lamentations. She received the Living Tradition Award for lifelong commitment and service to the Catholic intellectual life through teaching and scholarship in the Hebrew Bible from the Joan and Bill Hanks Center for the Catholic Intellectual Heritage. She received an honorable mention for best essay in a scholarly journal from the 2011 Catholic Press Awards for her article, I Am My Beloved's Song of Songs 710, The Glory of Being Human in the Old Testament. It was in Chicago Studies. She also received the Chicago Medallion for Excellence in Catechesis for uh, Biblical Catechesis of Adult Catholics from the Office of Catechesis and Youth Ministry, Archdiocese of Chicago in 2008. Though she has recently retired from Loyola University of Chicago, she continues to lecture at parishes and synagogues in and around Chicago. So let's welcome Pauline Viviano. They told me I only had 10 to 15 minutes uh, which being Italian is an insult. <laughs> um, I'm going to show you why what the other two speakers said was already in the Bible. Uh, my specialty is Old Testament, and so much of my reflection will come from the Old Testament. But I do every now and then read that, that little book that's the appendix of the Bible. Um, and New Testament understanding of the human is informed already by the Old Testament. But it's also in a state of transition because it is emerging in the Greco-Roman world. Post-New Testament, as the church moves more and more into a Greek world, philosophical approaches to human nature will become more dominant. Now, let me say right at the beginning that my um, approach to scripture is to read it from within its historical and its literary context. And so right off the bat, let me say that the Bible is not a philosophical treatise, uh, and it is certainly not a scientific textbook. You would be hard pressed to find evolution in the Bible. Most of what it has to say about humanity has to be inferred from stories, laws, songs, sayings, prophecies, and in the New Testament from gospels and epistles. The Bible is traditional literature and that means that it contains the voices of many over a long period of time. It is difficult to be definitive in saying this or that view is the view of the Bible. Um, perhaps it is best to think of the biblical perspective as multivalent. Now I don't have time to go through all of the views, so I'm gonna try to stress what I see as dominant. Um, like our previous two speakers, I googled personhood <laughs> uh, and I came across the quality or condition of being an individual person. And right off the bat, that is in opposition to the biblical world. They, we tend to be an overly individualistic society and we th see things through an individualistic lens. But in the biblical world, people were orientated toward the group they gained their sense of identity and worth from within their social group, the family, the clan, the tribe, eventually the nation. The group played a larger role in social, economic, and political life in traditional cultures than they do today. If you were a farmer, every member of the family had to work together to meet the basic needs of the family. If you lived in a town, there was a considerable amount of mutual support and cooperation that had to be there for the town to function. You were taught to sublimate your wishes and desires to the needs of the group. The good of the group was valued over personal freedom and self-realization. The Old Testament knows little 
of the inner workings of the human body or the relationship of body and self or personality. They operate on simple observation and experience. With respect to mind and body, they considered life a gift from God. It was associated with blood, and blood has power because it is associated with God. So you had to have special provisions for handling blood, and you do have a number of, of uh, those laws in the Old Testament. They associated thoughts with the heart, not the mind, not the brain. And they associated feelings with the kidneys or the intestines. Um, I'm not sure they ever made a valentine that said, I love you with all my kidneys, but that's where emotions were. What they seemed to want to do was to tie the inner self very closely with the physical body. So there, there's not the kind of dichotomy that we tend to place. Breath is the vital force that sustained life. It's also power filled and it also comes from God. You are alive because God is breathing in you, not because you have a soul that animates you. If you have no breath, you're dead. Life, nefesh. Nefesh literally means neck. When God breathes into to the human creature, um, he becomes a haya nefesh, a living neck. As time goes on, neck will be used to stand for the person, for the cell. Um, but you do not have in the Hebrew Bible a concept of soul uh, or even, uh, you do have the spirit of God, but you don't have a concept of spirit as it will later develop. Soul as a personal essence that gives the person a sense of self while alive and bears their identity to a different plane of existence after death is a Greek concept that is simply not part of the Old Testament. The Old Testament sees humanity as unitary beings. They are not divided into body and soul. They are a living, breathing, thinking, emoting, physical entity. So it, it, there's not some kind of, of two uh, toned people. Now, they did not, as the Greeks were later to develop, have a negative opinion about the material universe or the physical world. Creation is good. God created the physical world. You are encouraged in Psalms to worship with your body, to sing, to dance, to shout, to clap, to raise your hands, to kneel. The Bible, the Old Testament in particular, well, New Testament too, uh, recognizes that you are sometimes frail and vulnerable to sickness and death, but life itself is a gift from God to be enjoyed. With respect to behavior, behavior, one is not free to do anything. We exist in relationship, as CJ pointed out, relationality. And these relationships impose limits on what we can do and what we can eat. They did not view the body itself as sinful, but it can be the channel through which sinful and harmful actions are carried out. Humans have the freedom to choose, but freedom is limited. You can choose good and evil. You can choose to worship Yahweh or the other gods. They were aware that there were many different human motivations for actions, but still humans were free to choose and they are responsible for the consequences of their choices. Uh, and for the most part, that consequence is realized in life. The Old Testament has no well-developed understanding of an afterworld. They do speak of Sheol, but that is simply the abode of the dead where you have no contact with God. So the, the psalmist always asks to be preserved from Sheol uh, because if he goes to Sheol, he cannot praise God. Later on in Judaism, what will develop as an afterlife is the notion of resurrection. And resurrection grows out of the understanding of the human person as one physical thinking emotive entity. You do not have a body. You are your body. If I was five foot nine, blue eyed blonde, I'd be a very different person, not the short cute little dago that I am. <laughs> um, 
So if Israel and Israel does move towards concepts of an afterlife, but it is resurrection, and that is what becomes important in the New Testament. If you as you are to have some kind of life beyond this dimension, then your body has to be involved with that. Now it is from, I'm gonna take my primary understanding of what it is to be human, uh, well, different later on, but right now, from the stories of creation, because they really set the stage for what continues in the, in the biblical text. In Genesis 1, humans are created in the image and likeness of God, and they are given dominion over the earth. It is clear in Genesis 1 that humans are the pinnacle of creation. Everything is prepared for them. They can't live in water, so we're going to get water out of the way. They can't. Uh, they have to eat something, so we're going to get some vegetation. They uh, are going to keep time by the heavenly bodies. And then they, they, if they're going to rule this earth, they need something to rule. And so they have power over the, the uh, animals, authority over the animals. Now, God delegates humanity the right and responsibility for directing and caring for the created order. Israel did not see humanity as slaves to the gods, as some in the ancient Near East did, um, but they are nevertheless rulers over the earth. But they rule in the name of God, that, and so they are God's representatives. They can't do anything they want. There are limitations. Um, and in the Old Testament, uh, they, they're not supposed to, they're supposed to only eat vegetables in Genesis 1, that gets changed later on. In Genesis 2, they're not to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Uh, and if you continue on reading in Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, you'll get a whole bunch more laws. The relationship with God is not something that really comes additionally. Human, humanity is so created to be in relationship to God. And it is determined by its relationship with God. In Genesis 2, humanity are created out of dust of the ground. And so humans are dependent on the ground for life. They cannot move too far away from that ground, what that ground provides in terms of food, uh, etc. Otherwise, they will die. And when God breathes into that human creature, it becomes a living being. And so humanity is dependent upon the, the uh, dependent upon God. So you have this much more frail and vulnerable creature who is dependent on the one hand on the ground out of which he comes and on the other on God. <laughs> Quite a contrast between the, the humanity of Genesis 1 who is the pinnacle of creation and rules over this earth. These two understandings of humanity, their greatness, their, the, the, uh, the, the exalted view, uh, what, is, what is man that you are mindful of him that you have made him little less than a god? Contrast with this, you are nothing but a worm of the earth, which is what the book of Job uh, says. But the primary affirmation of the creation stories at the beginning of Genesis is that we are creatures, and so we exist in relationship to a creator, a relationship of dependency. If we are creatures and exist in relationship to a creator, then our task is to come to know our creator, how to relate to that creator, to ourselves, and to the world uh, in which we live, uh, and to, to ourselves, to others, and to the world in which we live. Now, how does this get played out in the rest of the Bible? And here I'm going to do some broad sweeps. Um, one of the important uh, notions in the biblical world is the giftedness of life, okay, the positive aspect of creation. At the end of Genesis 1, God says, be fruitful and multiply. God moves towards abundance. God moves towards life. Be fruitful and multiply. It is said to be a blessing. He blessed them and said. The blessing is seen in the fertility of the land as well as in the fertility of the family. Abraham is 
uh, promised many, many descendants and great wealth. Over and over again in the biblical text, it holds out the good things of life, fertility, peace, prosperity. Uh, and even in the prophets who, who announced the, the destruction of the people, offset that destruction with the promise of fertility and peace in the future. In the wisdom traditions of the Bible, they long for old age and many children, because you live on in your children. Koheleth tells us to eat, drink, and enjoy, because tomorrow you're going to be dead. Um, and the lack of fertility, illness, death, was considered an affront and a punishment. That's not the way life was meant to be. It needs to be explained. Uh, and uh, the primary uh, explanation in the opening chapters of Genesis is that it is humanity's fault. But humanity seeks release from suffering and pain through laments, through forgiveness. In addition to being the giver of life, God in the Old Testament is understood as the one who delivers us. That God is not aloof, but involved in creation. Creation is a continuous, ongoing process in the biblical world. If God were not at this moment actively creating, we would all go out of existence. That's why the rabbis exempted God from Sabbath rest. If God rested on the Sabbath, the world would go out of existence. The sun would not come up. We would not be here. Um, but deliverance is God's response to the troubles of life. God leaves Israel, leads Israel from oppression to freedom, leads Israel through the wilderness to the promised land, battles on behalf of Israel, defends and protects them, and he stays with them when they are defeated. He heals, he reconciles, restores, forgives, and that is in the biblical, in the Christian Bible, fully realized in the redemption of but we as humans are also to be sanctified. Holiness in the biblical world is wholeness, completeness. It is to be a fully integrated human being. Uh, this will be expressed in the Old Testament as obedience to the law. You're to live your life in the presence of the holy, so ritual laws, what to eat, what to wear, these are all ways to to tell them how to move towards wholeness. But holiness, holiness is an attribute of a being that entirely fulfills the purpose of its existence and thus is at one with itself. To be holy is not something you do. It is something you become by living the commands that Jesus left us, to love God and love your neighbor. And this leads me to what I think is at the heart of what the Bible has to say about what it means to be human. So to love and to be loved. Relationality is at its core. In Genesis, God says it is not good that the human should be alone. And he creates woman. Dennis Edwards, an uh, Australian theologian, says, a radically relational God creates a radically relational world. Covenant in the Old Testament tells us that God enters into relationship. It starts with Noah and then Abraham and culminating in Israel's covenant with Yahweh. And in the New Testament, the Old Covenant is uh, absorbed into the new covenant, uh, uh, as Jesus says at the uh, Last Supper. But what I want to develop this, the way I want to develop this, is actually to look at the Song of Songs. By any account, this is a rather odd book to find in Scripture. It never mentions God. It never says what God is doing. It says nothing about what God wants. It doesn't give us any directives or even prayers. And it begins, let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. Not Israel was a slave in Egypt, none of those things, none of those dry, boring introductions. Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. It speaks of the beloved as a bag of myrrh between my breasts, the beloved who comes leaping upon the mountains like a gazelle, 
The beloved as beautiful, her eyes are like doves, her lips are like a crimson thread, her breasts are like two fawns, her rounded thighs like jewels, her belly a heap of wheat. The beloved is radiant and ruddy, his head is the finest gold, his locks are wavy, his cheeks like beds of spices, his lips like lilies, his legs like alabaster columns. It speaks of longing for the beloved, of wanting to be alone with one's beloved, of wanting to be touched and fondled in distinctively erotic sorts of ways. It is softened when they translate it into English. It's a little more erotic in Hebrew. It speaks in an earthy, sensual language of sexual attraction that seeks union with the beloved. I am my beloved, and his desire is for me. Now, nobody really knows why or how this book got included into the Bible. We don't know anything about its author or date, and there are, of course, many theories on these things. We don't, well, we don't even know for sure what it is. Uh, and when you look at the history of, agree of interpretation of the Song of Songs, it is all over the place. But I'm going to focus on what the majority view is today. There is broad agreement among biblical scholars that the Song of Songs is a collection of erotic love poems whose literal sense of song is the marvelous portrayal of passions and longings of human lovers. Its content is about love, lovers, and their relationship. Its tone is secular, sensual, erotic, romantic, and sentimental. Its mood is serious and passionate, teasing and humorous. Its lovers are young. There are more than one couple in the, the Song of Songs. They're concerned with passion, physical appearance, external attributes. They're not concerned with marriage. Confident in their relationship in spite of difficulties, and their love relationship and its consummation is an end in itself. Mutual sexuality is celebrated without shame. Lovers are equal in their relationship. Its recurrent theme is the search for the beloved. But must we see the Song of Songs only as a collection of erotic love poems? Does it say nothing to us of God? Is the delight of erotic love its only message to us? If we look at the Hebrew scriptures, when Israel wants to speak of God, it says, let me tell you a story. The story of Abraham migrating from his homeland, or the story of Jacob and his antics in securing the birthright and blessing. The story of God leading his people out of Egypt from slavery to freedom in their own land. The story of a kingdom with much promise that experienced death, defeat and rebirth time and again. The Hebrew scriptures in speaking of God point to what happens in the daily living of our lives. This is where God is to be found. In the Hebrew scriptures, we are told of a God who enters into relationship with a people, a covenant. Not a God who stands distant, not a God who busies himself only with heavenly matters. He is a God who accompanies his people into exile. He is a God who is always present. If this is God, a God found in the daily living of our lives, a God who chooses to be in relationship, and maybe the Song of Songs speaks to us profoundly of God and of who we are. We don't need to make the song an allegory of God in Israel or Christ in his church. It is precisely in the delight that the lover takes in the beloved that we come close to experiencing God. Dodili va'ani lo. My beloved is mine, and I am his. In that act of self-giving to each other, we experience the God who loves us into existence, the 
the God who does not abandon us in our sin, but calls again and again to repentance and rebirth. In the love we bear towards one another, as imperfect as our love is, something of the divine is revealed and experienced. But I would go even further. Scripture tells us that our beloved is not just our significant other. Indeed, it commands us to love not just another, but to love the other. You shall love the Lord your God with your, all your heart, with all your soul, which is nephesh, by the way, and with all your might. My beloved Dodi, our beloved, is to be God. St. Irenaeus said, the glory of humanity, the glory of God is humanity fully alive. But few quote the second half of Irenaeus' sentence, in which he says, and the life of humanity is the vision of God. As we come to know God as creator, redeemer, sanctifier, and love, we are on the path to becoming fully alive. Fully alive human beings live in gratitude for the giftedness of life. They rejoice that God's saving presence is always with them. They become whole and holy as they live in conformity with God's will. They become humanity fully alive when they love. For God is love, and those who abide in love abide in God, and God abides in them. What defines personhood? From the biblical perspective, love defines who we are. Love of God, love of a neighbor. And the more we love, the more human we truly become.